Small-time lawyer John Grisham has transformed his experience in criminal court to one of the nation's most successful careers in fiction. His novel, The Firm, tops the New York Times paperback bestseller list. His new novel, The Pelican Brief, holds the number one slot on the hardcover list. Both are Hollywood's on Hollywood short list as well, but Grisham still prefers to spend his time down on the farm in Oxford, Mississippi, which shows that he's one smart guy. Welcome. Glad to be here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. You and I have a lot in common, as a matter yeah, of fact. We're just discussing it, the one thing we don't have in common is bestsellers, but we both live, I live in Oxford, North Carolina, you live in Oxford, Mississippi, both lawyers. You got a farm, you got a bush hog, I got, got a, bush a tractor, hog. you yeah. got to cut grass. Right, so, right. Yeah. Both kind of country boys who are just sort you of... You have a law degree. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't have this, though. And this, let, let's talk about this. Talk about the books. Uh, let's talk. Forget, well, no, no, no. Forget farming and baseball. No, I want to get talk. to that. So what's wrong with practicing law? Why did you feel like you had to go write a novel? Well, I wrote uh, the first two novels. A Time to Kill is my first book. Uh, the Firm is my second. And I wrote those. And the Pelican books. Brief is your third. 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 Oh, yes. Don't <laughs> no, forget that one. Uh, I wrote the first two books over a five-year period when mm -hmm. I was practicing law. And I didn't know I was going to make a career change. I didn't know I was going to, yeah. you know, become a, a best-selling author. It, it's almost um, not an accident, but I, I didn't plan it. And yeah. uh, after things got kind of crazy with the firm, and we sold the movie rights, and we had a hardback deal and a paperback deal and foreign rights and all this, I said, "Forget the law practice, man." <laughs> I got up yeah. one day and walked out and didn't even turn off the lights. So. As I understand it, you took, you sold the office equipment or gave it to what to 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 uh, yeah. the, your, the PTA or somebody like that. Yeah, I had I had uh, you know just an uh, office full of furniture that I'd accumulated over the years and. And um, I should have sold it, but I packed it up. I moved it uh, down to my farm, and it just laid around the way. Finally, I gave it to the local, the school where public schools where my kids go to school. Yeah, all right, let me let me back up a little bit. Okay, you uh, went to law school where? Ole Miss. Went to Ole Miss. Um, Ole Miss is in Oxford. That's right. And and then went to practice not in not in Oxford, but in what? South Haven, Mississippi, which is a, where a suburb of Memphis, and yeah. that's where I grew up. That's where my wife's from. That's where our family still live. And um, I lived there for 25 years. I got elected to the legislature from that house district in South Haven, Mississippi, yeah. and, and that was home. And uh, Renee and I woke up one day about two years ago and realized we could live anywhere. Right. I mean, you can write anywhere. And, and I was determined to write and quit practicing law. And we, uh, we both fell in love with Oxford when we were in school there, and so we moved back. It's a wonderful little town of... Um, 10,000 people and 10,000 students, and it's a great place to yeah. live. But when you were practicing law, mm -hmm. and you're going to the courtroom, you know, and you look around you, and the story goes, this is now the Grisham lore, is that when you weren't busy with your own trials, mm -hmm. you know, you'd sort of sneak over there and you would see fascinating cases. Mm -hmm. A Time to Kill mm -hmm. is based on one of those cases, the story yeah. of... The inspiration came from uh, something I saw in a courtroom one day, yeah. and, I, and I really don't know... I don't think I would have ever written a novel had I not sort of ventured into this courtroom one day and seen this uh, uh, horrible uh, drama unfold. Uh, a, a little girl had been raped and she was testifying against a man who did it. She was 11 years old, 10 or 11, and um, incredible uh, testimony. And, and um, I felt a great deal of sympathy for her, but I also caught myself thinking about her dad and what he was going through. And, and I thought, you know, society really shouldn't hold a father responsible for doing what he has to do if his little girl had been raped. So a novel comes out of your brain, which is it the can. father takes revenge yeah. over on his daughter's rapist. Yeah, I, I started thinking about the story, and, and I thought about it for several months. Uh, I really became obsessed with this courtroom drama dealing with the father's uh, retribution. And... and um, one day I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fictionalize it. I'm going to scramble it all up. I'm going to put a lot of me into it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can capture this on paper yeah. and in words. And, and I, my goal when I sat down, I said, oh, I'm going to write the first page. Yeah. I'd never written anything before. I mean, I'd always read a lot of books. And, yeah. and I, I wrote the first page. What was the first line? Billy Ray Cobb was a younger and smaller of the two rednecks. <laughs> that was the first thing. <laughs> and it stuck for uh, about ten different revisions over a... Uh, five-year period, the yeah. first And you begin to write every morning, you get up at five o'clock, and write until nine, and then go to the law office. No, I'd get up and go to the law office. Yeah. I'd, I'd be, uh, my my uh, home was just a couple of miles from my office, and I would go to, I'd go to work, uh, you know, at 5.30 in the morning, uh, sit down and start writing for a couple hours before the day started. Yeah. Lost a lot of sleep writing the book, but over a period yeah. of uh, three years, the pages had really piled up, and 
it was finished. And you sent it off to what you had your secretary mail it off to some every publisher or agent you yeah. could think of. And finally, number sixteen, a guy named Jay Garron, I yeah. guess his name was. Yeah. He writes you or calls you and says, "This is not bad. Yeah, I think I can sell this." He called. Uh, he called me um, and said, um, uh, "I want to represent you as a. I want you as a client." Yeah. And shortly after that, two other agents called and they said send me the rest of the manuscript. And there was a yeah. big difference in the yeah. way you handled it. Because you'd send different chapters to different agents. Oh, yeah. different we had, I had stuff. I didn't know anybody in New York in yeah. publishing. And, and I used the old shotgun approach. I just sent it to everybody, <laughs> and everybody sent it back. And, <laughs> said and said I, thanks, but no thanks. I kept you all know, the rejections. Go some, back to practicing law. Yeah, some of the rejection letters were very nice, and I kept them all. And, yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was almost <laughs> fun to get rejection letters. At least I knew somebody up here, something was happening. You yeah. know, they were saying no. And uh, Jay Guerin said, um, send it on. And I did. And it took him a year to say. He was turned down by a lot of folks also. A time to kill. A turn down. Kill. Finally got published five or 6,000 copies. 5,000 hardback copies. Yeah. It's going to be reissued. And you think it's your best book. Yeah. Why? Well, it's a different type of story from the firm of the Pelican Brief. It was written... I, I am very biased. I mean, this is uh, something I, you know, I'm very protective of. Uh, because it was written over a period of time, and I never dreamed I'd get it published. It's very autobiographical. It was very painful to write. I couldn't it's write autobiographical it. in what way? And the young attorney is basically me. Right. Uh, and painful because you're trying to be the, well, the truthful issue. about yourself. Th that uh, truthful about uh, uh, the race relations in the book. Truthful about uh, the the deep south, the people. Um, I wanted to be fair and accurate, and and, uh, and I wrote. The, I couldn't write the book now because I have a daughter now. Yeah. I didn't have a daughter then, and, and and I go back now and I read the first chapter. Sometimes of a time to kill, and wonder how anybody could write something like that because it deals with the rape of the child. Yeah, it'll be out in July. Yeah. It's out now as a trade paper. In fact, uh, it's sort of uh, fun to talk about. But this Sunday, uh, it hits the New York Times list as a trade paperback. On, on the paperback list. Yeah. Well, uh, I thought the firm is on the paperback list. It's, it's the same it's, list? Yes, yeah, same so list. So firm is one, and the time to kill will be what? Fourteen. Fourteen. And the Pelican Brief is number one. Yeah. In now, how does that make you feel, other than well, good? Uh, <laughs> wealthy, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't... Uh, I mean... I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what else I could do. Uh, when you got... Uh, when, you, when you're atop both yeah. lists... Um, does it get any better than this? I don't see how it could. Yeah. Uh, you got Little League in your life. Uh, but we have the draft tomorrow night. I have to get back home tomorrow night. We draft nine-year-old baseball players tomorrow night. And we trade them. And we have the injured reserve. We have the uh, waivers. We have all that kind of stuff. Now, what are you, the coach? And we almost have fist fights over yeah. these nine-year-old kids, uh, yeah, the coaches. You know the co we sit around the table like this and we draft. We you know what you're doing to these kids. They don't, they're not there. They, they, we, we wouldn't dare let them see what we do. That We'd be ashamed. You know? You've got your eye on certain kids you've seen oh, in the neighborhood yeah. who you know yeah. could make a difference with your team. Oh, yeah, and we know some of these kids, and we tell them to show up at right. the tryouts and do not catch a ball, <laughs> strike out, don't hit, don't let anybody see you, and we'll get you on our team. <laughs> Fake it's, it. Oh, it's ever horrible. It. We're trying to get them ready yeah, for the now, major yeah, league. In terms of winning the Little League Championship, yeah. first in Oxford, I guess that's it, isn't it, Oxford? Yeah, well, we have state playoffs. Okay, so you could go to the state, too. Well, I've never been All there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe never, this year. You've never had a bestseller. Now, how would you compare that with, um, with having a number one bestseller? Pretty high up there, pretty close, wouldn't it? Oh, sure, yeah. If we went undefeated this year and yeah. won the state championship, yeah. Yeah. oh, I'd leave this in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> would you? Now, what if you could manage for a day, be a be a manager for a day in I think that's what my real talent is. Is it really? I, I'm not you a big... Know, I'm my not, buddy not, Costas has just got a chance to manage for the, for the Oakland A's for a day. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, he, he, How'd he do The it? thrill of his <laughs> life. Well, he'd be Bob Costas. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> but he probably could, rem could work that up because Tony La Russa is a lawyer, too. That's right. So you that's could right. probably work, although the regular the season is now underway. Let me just go quickly in terms of there are a lot of interesting things to talk about. One, this was a big bestseller, mm -hmm. uh, hardback. And then somebody purloined a copy out in Hollywood. Paramount buys it for $600,000. You're in church. Yeah. And they call your wife and say, Renee. Yeah. My, my agent called and said, We're, I need to talk to you. Is that right? Renee's your wife? Yeah. Yeah. She said, Well, at that time we lived about two blocks from church, and on Sunday morning it would take about four trips yeah. to get everybody, right. my wife and two kids and I. And I already got mad and left because she was late, so I went on to church. And, and she came to church and she, was a, she had turned pale, and she said, You need to go call New York. Right. I said, well, uh, why? And she said, well, they're about to sell the film rights to the firm. There was no book deal right. on the firm, and I hadn't talked to anybody in New York. This is before there was a book deal. 
Yeah, long yeah, before. Because they cut in a copy. And it's $600,000. Yeah. Yeah. But they never let you write the screenplay, which would really make me a little bit T.O.'d. I was a T.O.'d for a while, then I got over it. I said, okay, look, w once the firm came out and became a very popular novel, that brought a lot of satisfaction. It brought a lot of security to me because I can always say, look, I wrote the book and they made the movie, yeah. and uh, I know nothing about making movies, so... Yeah, yeah um, but as soon as you say that, this has also been bought by the movies, and guess who's doing the screenplay? Alan Pakula. No, he's the producer. Aren't you doing the screenplay? No. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> All these have long answers, yeah, Charlie. Okay. I mean, All right. Uh, it, initially, it was negotiated I would do the first draft of the screenplay for the Pelican Brief. Yeah. And uh, we all agreed on that. And then uh, about a month after that, I called Alan Pakula and said, I don't want to write the screenplay. Because and, you, you didn't. This I, is you, and they, the screenplay will be something else. With a novel, I control every word of that book. Every single word. I have absolute power of veto over any proposed changes. Yeah. If I don't like the cover, I can make them change it. If I don't like the photograph, I can make it. You know, it, it, total control. I, I listen to a lot of people, but with yeah. a screenplay, when you finish a screenplay, there are 15 people after that who can change it. And so it gets to be sort of an ego. Did you thing. read uh, Presumed Innocent, and did you read the other Scott Turow book? I read Presumed Innocent yeah. and uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, I read The Burden of Proof when it came out in paperback about two years ago. No, it yeah. came out as a hardback two years ago in paperback last year. How do you explain it that you, a bright guy, but who had not written before, I mean, Scott Thoreau had thought about writing, had gone to Stanford, had gone to writing classes. I mean, this was a guy who wanted to be a writer for a long time. And as a friend of mine, has been on this broadcast and other broadcasts I've done. And, and he, it was his mission. It was his goal. He hangs on to the law because he enjoys the law as well. You, on the other hand, fell into this, but you're also at the top of the bestseller list. I mean, what is it? Is it a storyteller's gift that you have? Yeah. A narrative yeah. push? Sure. It, it, it's it's the, uh, the ability to come up with good stories and to write them clearly and quickly and in a way that's very entertaining. And yeah. what did you learn from writing this that I might find in Pelican Brief? I mean, did you learn something from going through this experience in terms as you sat down to write, write Pelican Brief? Yeah, I, I didn't think that story was, I didn't think the firm was that terribly suspenseful. Yeah. When, I, I, I wrote it over a two-year period. Yeah. Uh, of course, when you write something, it's hard to keep any distance, you know, and, 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 and judge it. But I didn't think the book was terribly suspenseful, okay? And, and when it came out, suddenly people were saying, oh, I, you know, I didn't sleep for two nights. Yeah. Uh, I got in fist fights with my husband. I got a letter. Okay, I got one letter from a young couple. I've, I've received, you know, hundreds of letters in the last year, and the mail is really yeah. a lot of fun. Right. I got one letter from a, a young couple, and this was the ultimate letter. They, they said that they took the firm on their honeymoon, yeah. and they only took one copy, and so they both started reading it about the same time. Then they got to fighting over who would read it next. Right. And somehow through the, you're supposed to gather that through all of this reading, all this fighting, their whole honeymoon was wasted on the firm, and they never consummated their marriage. That's sort of what they want you to believe, okay, in their letters. It's real funny. I don't believe that for I, a second, I, do you? I wrote them back and I said, you guys, y'all win, win the award for the best story so far. But, um, now, let me just say, the firm is the story of a young lawyer who joins a firm in Memphis, which is, in fact, a, 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 an organized crime front and all of that. And, and you, you got the idea for that because you, said, you, you realize that some of your law school buddies, when they were applying for these big deal jobs at these big deal firms, we're making these kinds of questions, and we're asking these kind of questions, right? Where did the idea for this story, which is about two Supreme Court justices who were assassinated, and they may have coming before them cases that would influence the lives of other people. Yeah. It's a conservative Supreme Court, but these two guys, a liberal, one is killed, uh, a young man who's killed at a, at a gay place, mm -hmm. bar or something, and, and, and the other guy, Abe Rosenberg, is an old, distinguished jurist. They're both assassinated by the same person. And then you have a young lawyer uh, from New Orleans, law very student. bright, a woman, a young law student, mm -hmm. who comes up with the idea that there may be the reason, and the Pelican Brief is her memorandum as to what might have happened. Yeah, Am she, I doing she, pretty good so far? Yeah, that's about enough, Charlie. Okay. Don't, just don't give any more away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she comes up with uh, sort of an inadvertent, uh, sh she solves a mystery, you know, yeah. almost by accident. And she's so, having a love affair with a prop and all that. Yeah, all that good stuff. Get, well, we shouldn't tell any more, should we? No, that's all right, that's all right now tell me, where did the idea for that come from? Um, well, I, I used to tell people that I, when I was a lawyer, I'd sit around thinking about killing judges, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really not true. Uh, Who reads your books? Who do you think is the audience? Is it? It's, um, judging from the, the, the people I meet and judging from the letters I get, uh, I, I'm gratified when I see an 85-year-old woman at the book signing or a 14-year-old kid. Yeah. And I, I think it really cuts across, um, 
all different uh, age brackets and gender. However, their lawyers have bought the books in, in big numbers. Law students. Yeah. Um, and when I go to a, book, a bookstore now for a signing, 80% of the people there are lawyers or married well, to lawyers. And if I were you, I'd stay there and sign every one of them. I'd be so happy that somebody wanted to buy my book. Oh, I, I've never left a bookstore with people standing yeah, in line. And you hang out at that bookstore in Oxford. Square books. <laughs> yeah, and watch them come in there. Yeah. And you know what, what, where it is on the bestseller list? Oh, every week. Yeah. Yeah, every pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you, Charles. My pleasure. And come back and do this. We'll do it another time. Or we'll do it in Oxford, Mississippi. That'd be wonderful. At Square Books. Yeah, yeah at Square have, Books. Have, no, have, remote. Uh, <laughs> fried <laughs> catfish uh, or fried green tomatoes at uh, the Whistle oh, Stop God. Cafe. I'd love it. I'd love it. The Pelican Brief, John Grisham. Um, it didn't get any better than this. We'll be right back. Stay with us.